Welcome to an extra bonus episode from Luang Prabang in Laos. In this episode, I speak some more to my Airbnb host, Robin, along with her husband, John. This Australian couple now helps their adopted son and his family with running two guest houses. Meet Palais Bo, a digital nomad from Denmark on an epic journey around the world. At the age of 50, he made a bold decision. He sold everything, his house, his car, his furniture, and set out with a quest to visit every single country in the world, documenting everything along the way. This episode of the Radio Vagabond podcast is sponsored by Hotels25.com. Hotels25.com searches all the top travel sites to find the best deals on more than 430,000 hotels around the world. Hotels25.com, it's best price guaranteed. This is the Radio Vagabond Podcast. Robin has some stories from their time here in Laos, where she got into trouble. Well, I've been going to a certain temple uh, in Laos, teaching novices English. And one of the novices was in his 20, or just turned 20 actually, and um, he got in my car and I showed him how to change gears and he used to drive around the temple grounds while I was teaching English and never get out of first or second gear so there was nothing dramatic. And then another novice came to me and he was 17 and he said, teach it teach me how to drive the car, teach me how to drive the car. And I thought, oh, yeah, I think I can do this. And my husband already had um, a discussion with me that he said, don't do this, Robin, because if they hit a Buddha statue, you could be in really big trouble. And I said, darling, they're not going to hit a statue. We've got heaps of room. It's like two acres, this temple, and you, it's plenty of room to drive around. So I took notice of my husband, and we kept doing this for a little while. So the first night that this novice came to me, I sat him in the car and I taught him where the brake was, where the clutch was, and where the petrol, we call it the petrol pedal. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't quite pushing in the clutch far enough, so I told him he had to push it hard to push the clutch in to get going. And we went through it all, and I thought, right, he's ready now. So we turned the car on, and he got into gear, and he put, went from from nil to about, I don't know, 20 kilometres. All I know is we shot across the temple grounds like we were a rocket and I'm going, stop, 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 stop. But he didn't have his English ears in oh. <laughs> and all he had was this terrified look on his face and he was clutching the steering wheel and his head was down into the steering wheel and in the end I had leant across and I turned the car off and I pulled the keys out and we sort of ended up in a fence that wasn't sort of, um, it was a... What, Wait, what, what happened? Did he did he push the wrong pedal? No, he didn't take his foot off the pedal. Oh. <laughs> he forgot to take his foot off the pedal and he didn't push the brake. But we ended up knocking this fence down and went into a very old historic UNESCO boat. Oh. The boat is 65 foot long and this is a sacred boat. Apparently... No one is allowed to touch this boat except for the people that are on the boat. Females definitely aren't allowed to touch the boat. And the captain of the other boats aren't even, aren't even allowed to come and touch this boat because they're scared it will give them bad luck. So this monk had, novice, um, had thought quick, got out of the driver's seat. I jumped in the driver's seat. And when we made all this noise, people popped their head out from all over the place, over the fence, because the night markets happened to be on at the same uh -huh. time. And all of a sudden there was all this noise and there was people running in the temple and because the gate was part of a, a steel frame, it wasn't actually, uh, the fence, sorry, was part of a steel frame and when it fell over, the steel frame made a lot of noise. I had dinted my car quite badly. I couldn't even drive because the front fenders had gone into the wheel, but no one asked me how I was. And But we were lucky enough to change seats because if this poor novice had been found out, he would have been expelled and then his whole career would have been gone and he'd been studying very hard and I would be very upset if that had happened. So the, I took the blame. And before I knew it, the people were arriving in their pyjamas on their motorbike. Someone had rung the village chief and he arrived and he had two kids in their pyjamas and they were <laughs> everyone was there. Like there must have been 65 to 100 people there. And... No one could speak English except a couple of novices that were with me. And I thought, I'm in trouble here. I better ring my husband. 
And so I rang my husband and he said, I told you, I told you, <laughs> but you never listened to me. So in the meantime, we're trying to work out how much this is going to cost me. And they said I would have to come back the next morning at nine o'clock and have a bassy ceremony and that I would have to pay for three chickens, noodles and some beer. Three chickens, noodles and some beer? Yes. Now, when I was, this was translated to me, I said, what are they going to do with the chickens? He said, I don't know. I said, do they sacrifice them and pour the blood over the over the boat or do they cook it and eat it or, you know, what happens? He said, I don't know, I don't know. So I had this big grin on my face thinking this is really funny when my husband arrived and he just said to me, take that grin off your face, this is serious. <laughs> so I said, but it's funny too. But he didn't see the funny side of it. Anyway, he refused to come with me the next morning when I had to face mm -hmm. all this. So I actually got a, uh, someone I'd met at the guest house to come with me and another Australian and – They presented me with the bill, and the bill was like nearly three, four hundred dollars in. I can't remember what it was in kip. Oh, this is crazy! So when I asked the village chief to tell me what all the money was for, it was all for alcohol. There was still money. I saw the, the chickens. There were three chickens hanging up, and they were cooked, by the way, and the packets of noodles in bowls, and a few few trays of fruit. And people were arriving like they were going to a wedding. They were all in this beautiful silk outfits and they had flowers in their hair and everything else. And I'm thinking, this, I've never been to a ceremony like this before because normally they have bassy ceremonies for births, deaths, new cars, new houses, girlfriends, engagements, things like that. But th I think this is a first, a, um, a car running into a, um, a long boat. <laughs> So he said to me it was for the alcohol, and I said, look, this is a Buddhist temple, and Buddhists aren't even supposed to drink alcohol. So I tore the, bu the bill up in half in front of him and handed it back to him, and he was insulted. He went out the, to the side, and I saw him tell a group of men what I'd done, and one of them came back around to me with his broom yelling at me and shaking the broom in, in my face like this, and I said... I can yell just as loud as you can. But I didn't realize I'd forgotten. They couldn't understand what I said. So they probably thought I was swearing at them or something like that. So they went off to get the police. Fortunately, the police weren't there. So I then quickly had to ring my son, who didn't know anything about the incident because I, I knew he would be against what I was doing. And he came over and it took him ages to come over because he got all dressed up too. And I found out that they treat people who dress well better than people who dress down. And so he wanted to be on an even level, a speaking level with them. So he got all dressed up. He had his jacket on and his good pants and long sleeve shirt and all that sort of thing. And he went and spoke to the abbot of the temple and said that um, my mother is not prepared to pay this much money for alcohol um, and... Instead, we'd like to give a donation to the temple. So we made a um, 500,000 kip donation to the temple. How much is that in, in dollars? Just under uh, 100 Australian dollars. And the abbot, who I've known for a long time and who I used to teach English to as well, um, he, was, he said, that is fine. And um, please tell your mother not to get angry so quickly. <laughs> But I was then banned from teaching English at that temple. Mm. And since then, I, the, I've been going there for a long time, from 2008 to 2015. So I'm, I miss it. I miss it a lot because I saw those kids start from when they were, um, you know, 12 years old to they're 20 years old. Yeah. But it's just something that happens over here. You never know what's going to happen. You tore up the bill. <laughs> how, 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 how did you find the courage to do that? I was really angry because I myself don't drink alcohol. And I, I think I told you I'm what I call a, um, a smorgasbord Buddhist. I just take the bits I like. Mm. But the fact, that, the fact that I don't drink alcohol has got nothing to do with being Buddhism. I just don't enjoy alcohol. But they were going to waste all this money on beer. 
And the kids at the temple, you know, they need English books. They all come from really, really poor families. Most of them are at the temple just to get an education. Either their family split up or the father's an alcoholic or on drugs or vice versa or the mother and father are divorced or it might be grandparents trying to bring up grandchildren. And here they were just going to waste all this money on alcohol. So I just got angry. They haven't even got a bathroom at this temple. They all have to just uh, bathe by dipping a bucket into a well. Now that money that they wanted for alcohol could have built them a bathroom. So I'm very practical. I don't like giving my money away to drunks. This wasn't the only time I had a dealing with the police. Um, I have been a very, very bad person. I went to my son's village, which I'd been going to since the year 2000. Done many, many things in this village from building a bridge to helping the school to planting nearly 50 fruit trees around the school so that kids can pick fruit when they're at school. Many, many things. But the worst thing I did was I turned up with some friends and we gave out 150 free books, pencils and rubbers. And we happened to do it when the police were, was there and they arrested me because I did not have permission to give out free books in this village. Say that again, you need permission to give out free books and pencils? Well, apparently I'm breaking the land the law of the land. I'm breaking the law of the land because I came here on a vo on a um, tourist visa and not a volunteers visa. But when you look into it, there's no such thing as a volunteers visa. But for me to do it legally, I would have had to get permission from the tourist police, from the tourist department, and from the education department before I was allowed to walk into a school by myself with no Lao person and give them free books and free pencils. So what happened then? Well, we had to, because there was six of us, we had to then follow the police car into Long Prabang. They kept me at the police station till four o'clock that afternoon and told me to come back the next morning. Um, they interviewed me and my son, because he turned up to help, and a few other people turned up to back up that I'd you know, only done good things around the place. But everything we said we did just made the crime worse because I didn't have permission to do any of these things. So um, they ended up telling me I was going to have to pay 20 million kip, which is over 6,000 US dollars, as a fine for disobeying the land, the law of the land. Now this 20 no, million... No beer and chicken. No, not beer and chicken this time. No, I didn't get off that easy. This particular um, uh, law is because they're scared that some people are going to come into the village, give the kids free books and pencils and things like that, and then come back again and then try and preach Christianity. Ah, uh, okay. I didn't know that at the time. I've since been told that. However, they if the 20 million kip fine is the same price you pay if you kill a person on the road. So they were giving me the highest fine they could possibly give me. So my son bartered with them virtually for three days. So I ended up spending four days at the police station from nine o'clock in the morning till four o'clock in the afternoon because I refused to pay the 20 million kip. I said, arrest me. I'm not going to pay it. Just arrest me. I am refused to pay it. And they knew that they'd never arrest me because it would just be ridiculous if it got onto the news that a person was arrested for giving out free books. But I did have to pay five million kip, which was six hundred um, Australian dollars, and so that could have bought a lot of books for the kids in school. It could have helped a lot of people at hospitals and things like that. And I asked for a receipt, um, and they were very rude. There was about four of them, with all had stars on their lapels to see, you know, from two stars to five stars. I had people interviewing mm -hmm. me and um, I was sitting there on the second day and um, they wouldn't talk to me they were talking to my son and I said talk to me I'm the one who's done the wrong thing not my son they said can you speak Lao I said no they said uncross your legs because over here it's rude for a person to cross their legs because their toes go up and if your toes go up it's a like a bad gesture mm -hmm. like giving someone the forks with your fingers mm -hmm. but these days I mean that's 
that's so old fashioned. So they were being quite, they were trying to be heavy with me. And they told me that if ever I did it again, that they would bring me into the police station and they would make me pay the 20 million kip. They had my passport, so I, I had to get the pace, pay the 5 million. But when I got the receipt, I took it back to my son because I'd been told the receipt said that I, because I'd broken the law of the land by giving out books and pencils without the proper permission, I paid a fine of five million kip. That's what the receipt was supposed to say. When my son read it, he laughed. He said, Mum, do you know what this receipt says? It says that you have just made a donation of five million kip to the tourist department and the tourist police department. So therefore, they just put it in their pockets. And so that, it actually left me very deflated. I was, I thought I had won because I got the fine from 20 million to five. But when I realised that they'd only just cheated me the whole time, um, I was very upset over it. And now I'm not allowed to teach. No. <laughs> you're, 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 not, you're not allowed to help. No. Uh, and, yeah. But I still, but I still do. <laughs> I run a summer school for three months of the year, and the kids come down from rural areas, and they're all kids that um, want to improve their English. Um, and some of the kids' stories are quite tragic, and some of them, are, you know, are very, very clever kids, and they just need that little bit of extra help. So when they go to university, they're better at. Um, they have it an, an equal standard of the kids that were brought up in the city. I really recommend you to come here to Luang Prabang and if you do, please consider staying with Robin and John or at their son's guest house. They're all wonderful people that we now feel lucky to be able to call friends. Robin, uh, my daughter and I, we want to thank you so much for uh, for taking us in and uh, we feel we have an aunt and an uncle here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only 10 years older than him, would you believe? Yeah, that's 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 why I said... <laughs> could have said older brother and older sister. Never mind. Do you know, you're the first Airbnb people we've had, and so we're only officially on site um, this week. And it's been a great pleasure having you guys here. We've had many people come and stay, but this is their first father and daughter experience. So we yeah. wish you lots and lots of good travels and lots and lots of more travel stories on your next journey. <laughs> Thank you so much. If you like this podcast, please subscribe in iTunes or the podcast app on your smartphone. You can see pictures, watch videos, and read much more on the radiovagabond.com. Palais can be reached for interviews and public speaking gigs on mail at the radiovagabond.com. Now we're off to our next destination, and this time we're flying. We're going to Hanoi in Vietnam, and we're so looking forward to that. My name is Palabo, and we gotta keep moving. See ya.